It's time to talk sports. It's Hacksaw's Headlines. A panorama of the world of sports. Stories, comments, and opinions. Touchdown, San Diego! Now, here's iconic sports talk show host Lee Hacksaw Hamilton and co-host John Riley. It's a Thursday. Who wants to talk sports? We do. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Lee Hacksaw Hamilton along with my co-host, John Riley, and we welcome you to our Thursday podcast. We have an enormous number of topics on the table as we get together every Thursday. John, before we launch, and of course we're going to talk World Series where they're launching a lot of home runs. Before <laughs> we launch, let's explain to all the people following us on YouTube and Facebook about how they can subscribe to get the alerts of what we do, not only on Thursdays with our big podcast, but what we do during the week. And then also bring up our fans forum where the viewers, the listeners, can get involved. Yeah, so there's there's a lot there, Lee. So first of all, you can subscribe just by clicking on the subscribe button there on YouTube. Click on the bell. You'll get the updates. If you're following us on um, Apple Podcasts, on Stitcher, Spotify, you can click on the subscribe button there. And while we're doing the podcast, you can participate. You can get involved. You know, just if you're following the live stream on Facebook or YouTube, just type in your comments and questions for Hacksaw. We'll get to those at the end of the podcast episode in the Fans Forum segment. And I also invite everybody who follows us on our podcast, please sample my website, leehacksawhamilton.com. It's all written, a ton of different things. If you liked our sports talk show we did on radio for all the years in San Diego, the best 15 minutes in sports, Hacksaw's headlines, one man's opinion column, it's all on my website. It's written, and you can also access our podcast on my website too. John, have you enjoyed the World Series? We're not at the finish line yet. This thing is upside down. Yeah, I mean, it's been crazy. I mean, last night was the no-hitter. The night before, the Phillies were hitting bombs. There were controversy about maybe tip pitches. I mean, I'm sure we'll probably get into some of that. But this has been, just as you said in the beginning, a really entertaining World Series. Jerry Coleman, the legendary voice of the Padres and the Hall of Famer and one of the most popular people in San Diego, had a favorite phrase in baseball. Go to a ball game and you'll see something you never saw before. <laughs> and we can check off a lot of different boxes, John, with what's happened in this World Series. Just think, Nick Costellana saves the Phillies in the first game with the bottom of the ninth inning shoestring catch that allows Philadelphia to bat in the 10th and they eventually win that big game. Then you got Justin Verlander, Cy Young Award winner, 232 career victories, John and he's 0-6 in the postseason and can't get anybody out. Is there an explanation to that? Then you got Bryce Harper hitting home runs. You got five home runs and in five innings in home run derby there in Philadelphia. And then out of nowhere with this lineup that was hitting 284 at home, the Phillies lineup, mm -hmm. with 17 home runs at home, the Phillies lineup got no hit by Christian Vasquez. Like Jerry would say, go to a ball game, you'll see something you've never, ever seen before. Your response. I mean, it was incredible. And, you know, in Philly, the fans are jacked up, just like they were at Petco. You know, everyone's standing up. That's what Smoltz was always talking about. And it's just been a very entertaining World Series. I mean, when was the last time there was a no-hitter? It's got to go back to the 50s, right? 1956, Don Larson, Yankees, Brooklyn Dodgers. By the way, I was a young pup. I saw that on TV. How about that? Well, well right on. <laughs> um, and yeah, he's like a local guy from Point Loma, right? Yes. So yeah, that's terrific. So um, yeah, this has just been a great World Series. And now what the Astros are tied, right? Now it's 2-2. So now it's a three-game series and anything can happen. And it's best of three and somebody's going back to Houston and somebody is going to win this. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is staggering to me that Christian Vasquez with his high heat was able to no-hit that batting order. Those guys never came close to lining one off the wall or hitting a really tough ball that somebody had to chase down. I mean, it was just business. Like, he was mowing them down. The, the Houston relief pitcher retired 20 Philly batters in a row in that ballpark. You know— Listening to the pregame show with you know you know A Rod and and Poppy and and uh, you know the big hurt, but A Rod talked about that in the beginning of the game where they couldn't hit the fastball and they had to go back to it because they were able to you know maybe pick up the, the they maybe they were giving up the signs for the 
or, or giving a signal that they were about to do a curveball. But when they were throwing the fastball, the Phillies were largely un, um, inept. And we saw it last night. Amazing. So we got it's now down to a best of three series. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is going back to Houston. I still think anybody can win this because you may have put your thumb down on Philadelphia's batting order, Christian Vasquez. But can you repeat that? Can you do it again? I just don't know. And even in Houston, where the Astros were unbeaten when the World Series started, then got beat. Mm-hmm. Even in Houston, Phillies can hit. Astros can hit. Both teams have proven they can win on the road. Trust me, John, this thing is not over. No, not at over at all. I remember back in the day, remember the teams, their number one starter used to be able to pitch in the first, the fourth, and the seventh game, and they don't do that now. So the pitching matchups, when you get here into these final three games, anything can happen. Do you like Smoltz as a color analyst? You know, part of me says... Wow, his analysis is so, from such a different perspective. It's it's a mental approach to the game as to how a pitcher deals with hitters, how hitters deal with pitchers. I mean, he he floors me because he says things that make you think about the intangible things of pitching. It's just not, can I get 97? Can I get movement? It's how you set up a guy. I mean, I've been fascinated if you listen closely to what John Smoltz says. Now, now some of the national critics have said, geez, the TV broadcast, there's no emotion there. There's, you know, do you want X's and O's? Do you want historical stories from these guys who've been in great games? Or do you want the thinking man's approach to the World Series, which I tend to think Smoltz provides us? Your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, all the emotion and energy is coming from the 45, 50,000 fans in the stadium. So I like the way Smoltz is approached. He, to your point, he's a thinking man's um, analyst, but he's also not ego driven. You know, he just seems really sincere and authentic. And and he's a guy that we, we have this gravitational point pull to. So yeah, good on him. I mean, maybe we got a new star in the broadcast booth. Okay, on we go. We're headed to the off season. Once the World Series is over, there will be a mad rush for free agents. Everybody will then declare free agency. Then we'll have qualifying offers where teams can make a $19.8 million offer to retain their in-house free agent. That does not happen very often. But there's a lot of things going on, John, in baseball right now with roster movement from teams that are no longer playing. Yeah, I mean, we're we're seeing all the the rumors and machinations about what the Padres might do. We talked a lot about Aaron Judge and what might happen to him on on the market. But, you know, what, what team do you want? to take a look at today. Let's start with the guys that didn't get out of the first round, which stunned me because they had a pretty good season. Let's talk about the St. Louis Cardinals. Uh, Surprise decisions on their players. Uh, They said goodbye to Albert Pujols this week. He officially filed his retirement papers, John. 22-year career. Amazing. This guy, we always talk about number one draft picks, big money. This guy was a 12th round draft pick. Like 252nd player taken out of a community college in Missouri. And look what Albert Pujols became. 294 lifetime career, 703 home runs, bulk of his career with the Cardinals, then a decade with the Angels, a a cup of coffee with the Dodgers, and he went back to St. Louis. And at age 42, he hit 270 with 24 bombs as he vaulted over the 700 career mark and, and went past Alex Rodriguez. Amazing individual considering where he was drafted. And I'll tell you, tremendous human being. What he and his family have done for foundations in St. Louis during a decade run with the Cardinals, and then what he duplicated and what he did in Anaheim, even though that was not his team, what he did in Southern California, he is one special individual. Yeah, I, I agree completely. And to your point, he yeah, he wasn't a heralded high draft pick. And he kind of took a funny route going through a community college in, in Missouri, even though he's from the Dominican. So it's kind of an interesting path. But I remember when he first came up, he was just out of nowhere. Like, who is this guy? He was hitting 300. He was hitting for power. And I think back then he was playing third base for the Cardinals. Um, but what a career. A man... Great respect. And you said he hit 24 bombs as a 42-year-old, but is he really 42? You know, that's always been the controversy. But still, let's just pretend for a moment he's 46. Well, hell, if you can hit 24 bombs and you're 46, you know, tip of the hat to you. Uh, Tremendous career, tremendous person. Uh, Cardinals also saying goodbye to a bellwether of their roster. 
You think about how many years Yadia Molina caught behind home plate. And the wear and tear factor on, on catches is unbelievable. And yet he continued to hit. And he continued to throw guys out. And he continued to pound on the bases. He is just retired. Special guy. Now his battery mate, and this is strange, Adam Wainwright is not retiring. He has just signed a one-year extension to come back and pitch next year for the Cardinals at age, I want to say, 38 or 39. It'll be his 18th year in St. Louis. He's the one that calls, what do you call it, the lollipop curve? Yeah. yeah I mean, he just, an amazing pitcher. He's going to come back and he's pitched. He had a pretty good year last year. And this guy has recovered from elbow surgery at, at, at a much older age than most guys. So he stays the course. And one other baseball note in St. Louis. Major League Baseball, John, it's always about money, my contract, my free agency, my opt-out clause, my no-trade clause. Nolan Arenado just opted in, opted in to stay in St. Louis. He's not opting out to put himself back on the market as a big home run hitter and a 10-time gold glove winner. Arenado is going to stay next five years on the contract. He had one chance to step away or opt back in. He's opt in. Five years, $144 million I think, is left because St. Louis is such a great city. And I think he has great respect for what the Cardinal organization is historically. So you got Yadier to talk about. You got obviously lollipop curves and Wainwright, and then your comment on what Arenado did because that's really different. Yeah, I think if if you're Wainwright and they're willing to pay you big money to come back for another year and you only pitch every five days, why not? You know, I mean, this is the game you love, and if you can, you know, make some bank, good for you. Um, as far as Molina goes, I remember when he came up, he's one of three brothers, right? Mm -hmm. And the other two brothers were no slouches; they were pretty good too. And he, he Molina developed into becoming a better hitter as his career uh, went on. Um, but another really special guy. Uh, but as far, I mean, Arenado, you know, we kind of have this grudge match with him here in, in uh, San Diego because we're fans of Machado and Machado doesn't get the gold glove and everything else. But usually these guys, what they'll do is they will opt out, even though they know they're going to renegotiate with their existing team and just sort of kind of re-up their contract. So I'm surprised Arenado didn't do that, but maybe the St. Louis ownership maybe promised him something down the road that we're unaware of. Might be, but you know, he also went through a really bad experience in Colorado, and he was a really great player with the Rockies and mm -hmm. did well, bat and glove, but he stood by and he watched the Rockies trade everybody away, and then he got traded. The only guy left in Colorado, aside from the manager, Bud Black, who's had to live with this crisis, mm -hmm. is Charlie Blackman. Everybody else is gone from what was a pretty good Rockies franchise. So I think Arenado has learned about the business side of baseball, and he's in St. Louis, which it is a great baseball city. Oh, 100%. That yeah. yard is downtown, and right next to that stadium is the Cardinal Hall of Fame and the St. Louis Browns Hall of Fame. It's it's really cool. Okay, from that, let's talk about the commissioner's office. Okay. I mean, I saw these comments um, you know, in the news, and – it's it's a shame that we've got some MLB uh, franchises that are really in trouble, and they're in markets, and these teams have had success, but now what's going to happen? Rob Manfred stands up and sounds off this week about the ongoing stadium crisis, and this has been going on for months, mm -hmm. years. The Oakland A's situation, the Tampa Bay Rays stadium situation, Manfred and I was surprised he made this comment because they are still trying really hard in Oakland to finance this this $12 billion entertainment district at the Howard Terminal, Terminal Waterfront site so the A's can build a new stadium that the A's say they will pay for. They still don't have the $12 billion package put together for all the other things that would be part of it, hotels, office buildings, etc., Rob Manfred stands up and says, I, I don't see a finish line here in Oakland and time is running out. This is not going to go on forever. And Manfred had already given the athletics permission to look at Las Vegas as a potential market. Now, he also intimated there's still a lot of work that has not been accomplished in Las Vegas. I think the state of Nevada, the city of Las Vegas, Clark County, are really taken back by the amount of state money that was given by politicians to the NFL franchise to build Allegiant Stadium. And now suddenly there's a lot of pushback, John, from, from Las Vegas citizens, Nevadians, uh, and from some of the politicos that we're not doing this again. We're not 
given a golden check to the next pro team that thinks they want to move here. And that, that team is the Oakland A's. So Rob Manfred says, we're not making any progress in Oakland, despite the fact the mayor says, yes, we are. And he says, if they can't get this thing done in Las Vegas, we'll let them look somewhere else. And the somewhere else is Montreal. Montreal's mm. got the money. Montreal's got the land. Montreal wants back in baseball after the Expos were taken away from them. Uh, he Manfred also made another comment, which kind of surprised me. He must have the approval of the owners, or maybe he's doing it on his own. He says, we can't solve the athletic situation in Oakland. We will void the relocation fee if they want to move somewhere else, whether that's Vegas or Montreal. Charlotte's out there. Nashville's out there. Portland's out there. They all have baseball committees. Nashville may be ahead of the rest of the pack because uh, Dave Dombrowski, before he went to Philadelphia to be the uh, president of baseball ops, headed up the Nashville syndicate. So they've done a lot of the groundwork to build a stadium, and I think they may have the financing close to being done. So Manfred says, Oakland, if you can't solve this, they're going to go to Vegas. But if they can't get it done in Vegas, we're going to let them talk to Montreal, and we will waive the franchise relocation fee. So commissioner really taken a push uh, with the to solve the A situation, Tampa Bay, he thinks they're getting closer uh, to finding a way to finance and the land uh, to keep the franchise on the Sun Coast. Tampa Bay, St. Petersburg, most stunning thing to me, Tampa, St. Pete, massive retirement communities. Baseball fans came from everywhere. They don't go to the games. Their TV ratings are through the roof. If it were not for the Oakland Athletics, Tampa Bay would be last in attendance in baseball. And by the way, when you look at the baseball standings, it's been a pretty good franchise. Mm -hmm. uh, Stuart Sternberg has put together and operated in the last group of years. So they think they're making progress in Tampa. Your reaction to what Manfred had to say about the whole Oakland A's mess? Well, for the A's, it's, a, it's encouraging to see Montreal might get back in the game. I like hearing that. And they've got Olympic Stadium. You know, they probably build a new facility. But I remember the A's wanted to move to, new, to San Jose. And that would have been a great fit. But that was the Giants' territory. And they were able to ixnay that deal. Now, I've, I've often heard that Portland was in the driver's seat for the next franchise, but maybe Montreal's jockey to the front of the pack. So the A's, I think, only have, what, one year left? A couple of years. A couple of years before, you know, the, the clock's ticking. Um, and yeah, Manfred should be sounding the alarm bells because they got to make a move. Um, as far as Tampa goes, it's interesting you say that because there's so many retired people there and that you know, that makes sense. It's Florida, and they're all from somewhere else. So they're Yankee fans or Cubs fans or whatever. Um, but like, think about when we go to the games at Petco. I mean, how many retired folks do you see at the game compared to how many 20-somethings and 30-somethings that you see there? It's the young people that make that stadium so vibrant. And it's the young people, I think, that maybe Tampa is unable to get in to, you know, be Rays fans. So maybe that's just not going to work out in, in Tampa. Yeah, players, it's interesting. I asked a couple of Padres, Chase Headley, who had been in the American League in addition to having been with the Padres, uh, said it, it's a nightmare to play in this in that dome, Tropicana Field. He says the strangest thing he's ever been in. The lighting is weird. The turf is weird. There's catwalks at the top of the roof. Balls are ricocheting off the catwalks. They become ground rule doubles. And there's nobody in the stands. Yeah. He says it's the weirdest environment to be a player in, to have a good team and not have any fan support. So commissioner is, is kind of pushing ahead on that. So those are the baseball stories. Before we jump uh, to the NFL topics on the table, remind our listeners again about subscribing to our podcast so the bell can ring and they'll <laughs> know when we put new stuff up. And then also about what we're going to do right at the end of the podcast here. Yeah, so you can subscribe on YouTube, but click on that subscribe button. If you click on the bell, you'll get alerts when we have a new live stream, when we upload a new segment onto Lee Hacksaw Hamilton's YouTube channel. And then, yeah, we, we'd love to take your comments and questions. Uh, just type them in on YouTube and Facebook. We'll see them on the screen here. We hold those till the end of the episode for the fans forum. And that's when you can have a conversation with Hacksaw. National Football League, we're almost to the midseason evaluation time. We'll probably cover that next week. But something happened this week we'd never, ever seen before in the NFL. I mean, the, the, the trade deadline was like what we see in Major League Baseball. I mean, just so much activity. It's just really interesting as these teams are, you know, putting their chips on the table to win now versus those that are plotting to win down the road. 
17 trades made at the trade deadline in the National Football League. John, uh, this was historical in nature. It had never happened before. And I think you and I last last Thursday talked a little bit about the NFL is now run by different people. You know, baseball has been overwhelmed by the metric system and, and analytics and Harvard graduates who are now general managers have changed the game. I think the NFL has got some of that happening now. I also think there's a new philosophy in the NFL is we get, need to win right now. And if I'm a new general manager or I'm a new coach, and John, if you don't fit my system, I'm going to trade you. Mm -hmm. And if I have to trade draft picks to get you and your contract off my salary cap, I will do that. And that's what's happened. Now, some of these deals uh, have been triggered by teams that think they're real close. And by making a deal, they're going to pull themselves in to the playoff race or a playoff spot. Uh, some of these deals have been made by teams that said, we're not going to pay that money to this guy who's an impending free agent. The Christian McCaffrey trade, which was the first blockbuster deal that happened, he goes to San Francisco, and we saw in his first full game with the 49ers the difference he could make. Running the football, catching the football, and by the way, dude threw a touchdown pass <laughs> yeah, of the football too. So that was <laughs> that was pretty impressive. The next big trade was Denver taking apart, and Denver's had a wretched season, taking apart their defense. Their defense is one of the top two in the NFL. They trade the big pass-rushing defensive end, Brad Chubb. I was kind of stunned because you don't find these guys on street corners, yet they, they traded him after four years with the team. They didn't feel they could afford to re-sign him. He goes to Miami uh, for a number one draft pick. Miami also made a trade to get Jeff Wilson, uh, the running back who had been a starter in San Francisco. Miami looks like they are loaded to go hunt this thing down and go deep in the AFC playoffs Jeez. with Tua uh, as their quarterback. Baltimore, it wasn't a sexy trade, but if you if you know John Harbaugh, you know two things. Lamar Jackson's going to make things happen when he has the football in his hand, and Baltimore's defense is going to beat you up. And they go get another linebacker that plays that way. Roquan Smith, who had been very unhappy, impending free agent with the Bears, traded. Uh, a couple of high draft picks go to Chicago. In that deal, Roquan Smith steps into the middle of a really street-tough Baltimore Ravens defense. You play them, it's like you're going walking down a dark alley. That's how <laughs> good they are mm -hmm. defensively. And it's just a typical transaction uh, that the Baltimore Ravens make. Strangers trade was within the division. Would you deal to make the enemy in your division better? That's what happened in Detroit. Mm -hmm. I don't have an explanation for this, although the Lions stockpiling draft picks. The rebuild has been really slow for Dan Campbell, the new coach. It's been a struggle for three years. They're 419 and one. They trade TJ Hawkinson. Pretty good pass catching tight end. He goes to the Vikings. And now he walks in, and here's the playbook from their new coach, Kevin O'Connell, the ex Aztec, the San Diegan from La Costa Canyon. They're six and one. And now they add a pass catching tight end to Justin Jefferson and Adam Thalen, the big play receivers, Dalvin Cook, the tough guy, explosive running back, and the veteran quarterback, Kirk Cousins. This is a heck of a deal for Minnesota. Might be a half year rental. Hawkinson becomes a free agent. But if we can catch a pile of passes and they can force their way into the NFC playoffs, which at this point, they're right in the driver's seat. Wow, that's a pretty good deal. So, I mean, think about that, trading with the enemy uh, in your division. And then there was a controversial trade, Jacksonville, and it's really been slow growth for the quarterback, Trevor Lawrence, who many expected to be a superstar in the league. And right now he's kind of pedestrian. They're trying to build the Jacksonville franchise, the wreckage left behind by Urban Meyer. Jacksonville makes a controversial trade for with Atlanta for what they needed, a down-the-field threat receiver in Calvin Ridley. Ridley is suspended this year. He had had an injury. There were mental health issues. He sat out, and while he sat out, he bet on games. So he is serving a one-year suspension. He won't be with the Jaguars till next training camp. But if if he is clean and if if he has solved this betting addiction that he had, and he says he has, they got themselves a heck of a player to team with the quarterback, Trevor Lawrence, and now the heavy-duty running back, uh, Travis Etienne. So those were the marquee deals. Trade deadline, your response? Um, I love it. I love the um, the action, the volatility. I love seeing, you know, 
you know, the, these classic uh, franchises like the Dolphins and the Vikings suddenly becoming competitive again. Um, they're putting themselves into the mix. But the other thing is, is like think of a team like the Lions. I mean, they've been in the doldrums for decades. Um, and because you just have to depend on the draft and maybe some free agent signings, it's hard for them to stockpile a lot of talent. You know, they weren't a, they're not able to do what, say, the Astros did 10 <laughs> years ago where you know they traded away all their guys, got a ton of picks, and then five, six years down the road, they became very, very good. So maybe we'll start to see some of that in the NFL. And if so, it'd be great to see some of these other franchises kind of resurrect themselves. Off the field, it's a terrible story. Kansas City's one of the best teams in the National Football League, and this involves Andy Reid and his son. Andy Reid's lost his oldest son to drug addiction, a heroin overdose. His youngest son has had a history of substance abuse, was involved with a drunk driving accident that maimed a five-year-old child and has left her brain, in, in effect, brain damaged. Kansas City Chiefs are paying all the medical bills uh, for this family from Missouri. Uh, Britt Reed pled guilty finally to felony DUI, came flying out of Arrowhead Stadium, up a ramp, 83 miles an hour, rear-ended a family's car that had stalled on the edge of their exit ramp, caused all types of catastrophic damage to this child, injured another child, multiple people got hurt, arrested immediately. Uh, Britt Reed, and it's very controversial, sentenced to three years in prison. The prosecution had the ability to sentence him to the max seven years without early parole. And for some reason, it did not happen. I don't know whether it was the prosecution, whether it was the district attorney. Did not happen. Family was enraged. The family was in tears when the judge read the sentence. Three years only for Burt Reed, who has a history of alcohol, amphetamines, and heroin. And he only got three years. Andy Reed has not talked about this with the exception of the first day when Burt Reed was arrested after the terrible accident coming from a coach's meeting at Arrowhead. An unbelievably sad story. That coupled with the death of the older son, Garrett Reed, who died in the Eagles training camp in the team dorm of a heroin overdose. Both these kids have a history of abuse, past arrests, in and out of drug rehab centers. It's failed multiple, multiple times. As great as Andy Reed is as a coach, you question... What was he like as a father as all this was evolving? It's, it's a sad story. It's not going to go away. And it's a terrible story for the family who have a five-year-old child that is, is a vegetable because of this drunk driving accident by Britt Reed. Yeah, I mean, it's a sad story. It does make you kind of wonder uh, how the children, you know, in this case, Andy Reed's children were raised. But they, they both have to find a way to escape reality and go to drugs and alcohol. But um, it's just really sad. And it's also sad when you see these cases where, you know, so-called uh, celebrities or marquee people in the media seem to get lighter sentences than other people. And that enrages a lot of folks. And in this case, you know, drunk driving, you know, as a society, we are learning to take it far more seriously. So when someone gets a kind of a light sentence, it's natural to question it. Very much so. Boy, not good times down in Tampa Bay. Let's talk about Tom Brady for a minute. Uh, team is not doing well. I don't think it's Tom Brady's fault. You know, if you look statistically, and I study these numbers, Tom Brady, now he only has nine touchdowns at this point of the season, which is a bit of a stunner. But he only has one interception. Tampa's not losing because of that quarterback. Tampa's losing because their defense is poor. All three of Tampa's top receivers have been hurt. In fact, I'm not even sure that Tom Brady has had his star tight end and his top two wide receivers on the field at the same time very often. They have a negligible running game, uh, which means that throw, throw, throw. And their defense, in a real stunner, has played really poorly. And Todd Bowles, the new coach to replace Bruce Arians, he was defensive coordinator. And most of those guys are back, and they're playing really poorly. So Brady's got to deal with all that. Three-game losing streak? Tom Brady, you kidding me? Yeah. And then he's got to deal with the divorce, and now it spills out. He and his ex-wife, Giselle, officially divorced last week. 
Uh, and they say it was amenable. I find that hard to believe. Uh, the, the indications are Tom went public in, this week and said, I love playing football. I have to play football. It's part of me. But I've missed 23 Thanksgivings with my family. And I missed 23 Christmases. And I missed all types of anniversaries and birthdays because I was doing football. I think he's kind of self-admitting. Maybe he wasn't a good husband, good father in the big picture of things. And how about this? $115 million. That's what Tom Brady's estate is worth. How are they going to divide that money up? I wonder what that prenuptial might have looked like. <laughs> Poor guy's got an awful lot on his, on his plate right now. Yeah, I mean, you know, kind of a joke to it, but he might get alimony payments out of this, <laughs> given the, the wealth of his, his wife. But, you know, sad story when someone's marriage falls apart. And for him, you know, it was kind of, he retired and unretired, and there was all the drama around it. But it's got to be so frustrating for him that he finally gets back in the game, he's, he's doing what he wants, and then the whole team's crumbling around him. And you're right, his stats are great. But you got to have someone that can catch the ball on the other end. And so he's he's just it's just got to be a miserable year for the guy. Yeah, he's not quitting. I mean, he's not blaming anybody. He's handled this adversity a little bit different than Aaron Rodgers has handled it in Green Bay because Rodgers is barking at his young wide receiver core and he's barking up the plays that are being called and nobody's pass blocking for me. Brady has handled it very differently. One other college note. And we'll be talking a lot more about the race for the college football playoffs. I'll tell you what they should be talking about right now is what the heck's going on on college campuses. Do you know we're into week nine of the football season in the collegiate ranks? Seven head coaches have already been fired in the first eight weeks of the season. Auburn is the latest. They hit the eject button on Brian Harson, the former Boise State coach. Nebraska was the first one after the third game of the season. Goodbye to Scott Frost, former quarterback at Nebraska. Failed miserably. Colorado hit the eject button on uh, Carl Durrell, former UCLA coach. Their talent level has just really bottomed out. How does that happen at a program that has had a great legacy in the Big 8 Conference and now is part of the Pac-12 but not really doing very well? So those are some of the big names uh, that were let go. And I, 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 I'm, it's just absolutely amazing. Wisconsin hit the eject button on Paul Christ, who had done a really good job. Uh, of course, Barry Alvarez had been there forever and ever. And so Wisconsin fires him. Georgia Tech fired their coach. They've struggled to win in the ACC. And Arizona State blew out Herman Edwards in the midst of an NCAA scandal that involved his coaching staff and illegal contacts during the COVID dark period. And they broke all these laws. I'm surprised the athletic director is still there. So uh, it's interesting to get rid of those seven guys in the last eight weeks. Universities had to write $57 million in buyout checks. These head coaches in their contract, if they were terminated, their payout was anywhere from $7 million to some cases $18 million. That's absolutely amazing what universities have to write to get rid of the football coaches. Why do they negotiate those things to begin with, John? Well, in many of those states, the head football coach is the highest paid state employee, yes. which is incredible. Um, but, you know, it, it's just like what you said with the NFL. These teams want to win now. And if and there's a lot of money involved in college sports, uh, in college football. So if the, if the head coach isn't getting it done, you know, next man up. But I just think of Herm Edwards. Remember, he was the head coach for the Jets and he gave that press conference. He goes, we play to win the game. But he wasn't winning the games in Arizona State. Plus, the, uh, the controversy, yeah, they got to hit the eject button. So they did. It'll be interesting to see who the hot guys are who might get hired to fill some of these positions. It's another topic for another day. Let's talk NBA basketball. Wow. Brooklyn, New York in the spotlight for all the wrong reasons. I find this hard to believe that the Brooklyn Nets fired Steve Nash. Steve Nash's record as head coach in Brooklyn was 92 and 62 in what I think is the worst set of circumstances a coach can operate in. He's dealing about going into a brand new building, the Barclays Center, a brand new owner who has no ties to pro sports. And by the way, he's got Kevin Durant and his ego He's got Kyrie Irving and his mentality, and he's got Ben Simmons and his immaturity. 
And by the way, James Harden was there for a short period of time because somebody thought it'd be a good idea to let him come in and play basketball there and hold the ball all day while everybody else stood around and waited for a pass. Steve Nash went 92 and 62 and got fired. Um, I, I don't know if this is all an offshoot of Kevin Durant's summer tirade that I want out of here or you get rid of this coach and this general manager. Well, they got, finally got rid of the coach. I don't know if this is more that Nash lost the locker room or that Nash could not impose his very professional will and his intelligence on Kyrie Irving, who's a loose cannon, or Nash could not make a player out of Ben Simmons, whom they gotten from Philadelphia in a fire sale trade, who's got his own set of mental health issues. What a disaster for a pretty good guy. Steve Kerr stood up uh, last night in a press conference and said, this is a brilliant basketball mind. This guy is going to do really well in his next head coaching job. So your reaction to Steve Nash, Brooklyn, and all the stuff swirling around him? Well, he's clearly the scapegoat. I mean, they, they felt like they had to do something, and it's easiest to get rid of the coach, but he's really not the problem. Um, but it, it is interesting, too, because in college basketball, the head coach is like the king of their program, where in the NBA, they play kind of a more delicate balance with their players in terms of who's the man. Players are running the bleeping league. Come on, be yeah, honest. Yeah, exactly. So you, you, that makes it all the more ridiculous that they're firing Nash because how are you going to control some of those basket cases on that roster? I mean, he was put in a tough spot. Okay, we go from that storyline to the next storyline involving the basket case on the roster. I'm talking about Kyrie Irving. History writes Kyrie Irving feuded with everybody in Cleveland and got himself traded because he couldn't get along with LeBron James. He goes to Boston. He's supposed to be the final piece of the puzzle that's going to lead the Celtics to great things. And he, quote, has mental health issues and takes time off. And Boston gets rid of him. He goes to Brooklyn. And now you get him in Brooklyn. And last year, he refused to get the vaccine when it was mandated by the state of New York. You can't practice nor you can play if you are not vaxxed. And he went on this public tirade. I'm not putting that stuff in my body, even though he had no knowledge of what the vaccine was all about. At the height, he wound up missing 52 games, cost himself $21 million. Finally, as COVID settled down and they changed the vaccination laws in the state of New York, he was allowed to come back and play road games. Could not play at home, could not go to Canada because Canada had different entry uh, laws to get into the country if you're vaxxed versus not vaxxed. So they had all that last year, and now this thing, this thing this week, with social media and all the hate and everything that is on and the political unrest in our country, he has 4.6 million followers on all of his social platforms, including Instagram, etc. He tweets out about this anti-Semitic movie that's out there. The movie is entitled From Hebrews to Negroes. Mm -hmm. uh, very controversial. Uh, very, very much off the mark, blaming the Jewish faith for the problems of America. Well, he tweets on that, saying this is where you can go check out the movie. He also tweets contact with speeches made by the very controversial Alex Jones, who's involved in all these lawsuits mm -hmm. about child killings, et cetera, has lost a billion dollars in three different pieces of litigation. He tweets to all his followers, in essence, sample this. Holy cow. Now you got everybody up in arms. NBA Commissioner Adam Silver today has ordered him to a hearing next week. The owner, Joseph Tsai, the San Diegan, has condemned him yet he's still on the roster. The NBA Players Association condemned all things that might be anti-Semitic, but never mentioned his name and has never stepped in to say we need to take action. The Anti-Defamation League lawyers went to the league office and demanded he be removed. On top of that, now the reaction from players, or should I say retired players, Reggie Miller, very popular NBA guard who's now on TNT as an analyst, stood up and went public the other night on television and said, how come none of you NBA active players who've taken strong public stances about black brutality, about George Floyd, mm -hmm. the death and, and riots, you're always taking strong stances, Colin Kaepernick. How come not one NBA player, active player, 
has made any reference to that guy and what he did. And then Shaquille O'Neal last night popped off, called him an idiot. Charles Barkley, who's got opinions on everything, most of them off the wall. <laughs> Charles Barkley went public and said, this man should be suspended. Uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar today called for all fans and NBA players to boycott the products that Kyrie Irving has endorsed. He has not been disciplined yet. I think he's got to be disciplined. And to top it all off, he's in denial that he did anything wrong. Kyrie Irving stands up, John, and says, First Amendment rights to free speech. Well, what are you freely speaking about? Anti-Semitism. Blaming Jews. Holy cow. And he's just, he, this is the guy that held a press conference last year and said, I've studied this. Did you know that the world is flat? The earth is flat. <laughs> this is a guy who's got this other history with vaccines and personality conflicts, etc. It's just an ugly story. And the big question is, what what is going to happen? Can Adam Stern suspend him for conduct detrimental to the league? I think they can. The fact that the union already announced and condemned anti-Semitism but didn't take action against him. Is the union going to stand up and appeal any suspension if Kyrie Irving gets suspended by the league? What does Jersey do? Does Joseph Tsai, who's been a stand-up guy, stand up and suspend this guy for conduct detrimental to the league? Somebody's got to do something. He can't walk free, I don't think. Your reaction? Yeah, Shaq is right. He is an idiot. Um, and, you know, because he, you know, he buys into all these goofy conspiracy theories. And by, you know, in the case of the COVID vaccine, it cost him $21 million. I mean, which is just ridiculous. And yeah, you brought it up. He thought the earth was flat. And he came out, said that, and he had to later apologize. So he's made so many of these you know, PR gaffes that it's damaging to the brand of the NBA. And the NBA, to their credit, took really strong action, strong messages around, you know, all the controversy that went down in 2020 and with the George Floyd protests and Black Lives Matter. If you're going to stand against hate, if you're going to stand against discrimination, if you're going to stand for, um, you know, being a league that brings people together. You have to condemn these kinds of actions by Kyrie. I hope the commissioner takes a strong stance. And oh, by the way, free speech, that the NBA can crush you for speaking your mind. The free speech is about the government, you know, telling you what you can say or not. Free speech doesn't apply in this case. Are you stunned not one active NBA player would step up and sound off about this? Yeah, it is. It's disappointing. Um, you know, maybe they're scared to make a controversial stance. I don't know. But to your point, they were so brave and so strong-minded, strong-willed when it came to the, the controversy in the summer of 2020, rightfully so. This is just being consistent and, and stepping up, in, you know, in this case, to call out hate. The story is not over. Trust me on that. Before we got a couple other unique topics we're going to talk about because we try to appeal to a wide variety of people. John, tell the fans again about Fans Forum. Yeah, so Fans Forum, I mean, we already got the, the chat lines already lighting up. We, we can see people dropping in questions and comments for Hacksaw. You can participate in the podcast. Just uh, type your questions and comments on the Facebook or on the YouTube feed in the comment section. We'll see them on the screen and you can ask your question for Hacksaw. Okay, on we go. Great sports weekend ahead. This is a little bit different. Been to Del Mar. Del Mar is cool. Oh, oh, Del, yeah, it's great. What a great place. What a great slice of West Coast, Southern California Americana. Horse racing this weekend. It's a Keeneland in Kentucky Breeders' Cup Classic. They developed this thing, I don't know, 15 years ago. Breeders' Cup is really successful. Breeders' Cup at the end of the horse racing calendar runs the $5 million Classic. And all the hot horses... The ones that have had good seasons and the ones that might be two-year-olds are going to be three-year-olds next year. There will be triple crown pr prospects. These are the ones that show up. Who is the favorite in the Breeders' Cup Classic on Saturday? It's been strange what's happened the last couple of years. The favorite was a horse called Fire... Um, Frontline? Fireline. I can't remember. I got so many <laughs> Horses always have the crazy names. Yeah, I've got, I've got so much here. Flightline. <laughs> okay, that's it. Flightline is the heavy favorite to win the Breeders' Cup Classic. Flightline is 5-0 and unbeaten. Flightline has won races by 13, 14, and 19 lengths this year. But Flightline did not run in any of the Triple Crown races. Not the Derby, not the Preakness, not Pimlico. It was a young horse that suddenly has arrived. 
Flightline is the favorite. Remember the Kentucky Derby? Rich Strike. Oh, yeah. Stole the thing. Yeah. Came from way back and yeah, outran that was awesome. everybody. Mm -hmm. People couldn't believe that. A horse hadn't done anything since that point in time. Faded badly. Preakness faded badly at Pimlico in Baltimore. Ran again at the end of the season. Faded badly there. Well, Rich Strike is in the field. I don't know if Rich Strike deserves to be in the field. Uh, the wild card horse is Epicenter. Epicenter finished second in two of the three mm -hmm. Triple Crown races. Bears watching. Neither the Preakness winner nor the Pimlico winner are going to run in the Breeders' Cup. And we've seen this in the last couple of years, and I don't think it's good for horse racing. I know we're excited to see what flight line might be, but it's not good for horse racing if the Triple Crown horses aren't running. I understand injury. I understand some may get put out to stud, but we don't have hardly, outside of Epicenter, we don't have anybody that did anything in Triple Crown races. And this is the second Breeders' Cup Classic in a row in which marquee horses weren't there. It's going to be a great race. Flightline looks like the one to beat. I don't know if there's anybody else who could chase Flightline down, but I, I'm kind of missing some of the other horses that I thought would be part of this whole mix. Yeah, well, I, I was looking it up, uh, you know, before we got started today, and there's a horse in the race called Life is Good. And and I'm, I'm a big fan of that clothing brand. And so it's great to see a horse <laughs> with that name. And, you know, when I go to Del Mar, I bet, you know, based on the horse's name and, you know, the odds and... It's just a really fun sport, and it's really fun to go to Del Mar and take it all in. You know, whether you're in the grandstands or you're in the infield, it's just a, it's marvelous. So good on them having the Breeders' Cup. Yeah, you'd like to see the Triple Crown guys there, um, but it's just a fantastic sport. I wish it was we had it more more of the big races on the West Coast. Well, they've kind of gotten into this rotation. Uh, West Coast has run here at Del Mar, will run next year at Santa Anita, and then what they're running at back east, or obviously back in Kentucky. So those are the two locales. Going to be fun. Uh, from horse racing, let's go to auto racing. Formula One. This is kind of an interesting finish. Max Verstappen runs for Team Red Bull, based out of Germany. Max Verstappen has just busted through the record for most wins in a season. They're getting ready to run the final races of the Formula One campaign. He's already won the championship. 14 victories this season. Most recently, the hottest driver in F1 was from Great Britain, Lewis Hamilton, who dominated. He's got 90-plus career wins. He has not won a race this season. Team Mercedes has just really struggled with the new setup. Verstappen and Team Red Bull have just totally dominated. But there's controversy, and there's a lot of unhappy people. McLaren, Ferrari, Mercedes, they're unhappy with Team Red Bull. There's a, a what they call a cost cap in F1 racing. It's like a salary cap in baseball, where they were trying to control the expenses because the rich teams have all this wealth where they can do a lot of off-season testing, wind tunnels, a lot of things. And the smaller teams can't. They don't, they're not able to keep up financially. And they, they're not as competitive. They're not putting guys on the podium, not getting the paydays. Well, Team Red Bull was caught last year over the cost cap. Uh, they had made a violation. They say it was a bookkeeping clerical error. F1 th went through this whole investigation. Formula One decided, yes, they violated the cost cap a bit. They fined him $7 million dollars. But the other teams are petitioning F1 in an appeal and say Max Verstappen won 14 races this year, probably based on some of the data they got when they were doing illegal testing in wind tunnels. We think you need to strip them of wins and strip them of points and strip them of prize money. Has not happened yet. Uh, so Max Verstappen, as they get ready to go the final two races of the season, Max Verstappen winning the championship of this controversy uh, is not going to go away. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because, you know, in, in, in baseball, you can go over the salary cap and you have to pay penalties. You might lose draft picks. Um, but here, apparently, it's a hard cap, right? So if you go over the over the line, well, yeah, they'll have these anecdotal kind of one-off, you know, penalties. But yeah, if you're one of the lower, you know, the lower funded teams, you've got to be angry about this. But let me just say this about F1. 
you know, F1's coming to America. Yes. And, and, and I think this is really exciting for the sport. Um, you know, the, the, there's a number of F1 Netflix series that have got great ratings here in America. So I'm excited about the sport. I'm excited about having some variety in auto racing because it's not just NASCAR. We're going to hopefully have a number of different categories here. Um, and I'm, I'm really anxious to kind of learn more about a lot of these European drivers. They're going to run next year, Miami. Las Vegas, and of course, they have been a raging success running the U.S. Grand Prix uh, in Austin, Texas. I don't know whether they're going to go back to Indianapolis. They have in the past, uh, but this thing has exploded. TV contracts have got a lot to do with it. Mm -hmm. It's become a, a go-to event. Um, I've never been to an F1 race in Austin, but I've watched the videos, and it's a party. Holy cow. And the clientele, they're all young. They are. It's young America that's kind of wrapped its arms around these guys. NASCAR is great. NASCAR used to be a good old boy, deep south thing. Now it's now it's national, mm -hmm. but it's lost a little bit of its pizzazz. And IndyCar, aside from the Indy 500, the IndyCar series is just not what it used to be. And I don't know how they're going to gather that back. Indy 500 is a slice of Americana. It's really special. Well, have you have you seen the video of the F1 at Monaco? Yes. Now that is a party. Uh, so you know, bring that on. Bring that to America. Speaking of that, I'll give you a sidebar comment. If you like movies, and I know you like movies, yeah. you need to track down the movie Rush. It was produced by Ronnie Howard, Mayberry's. Oh yeah, Andy Griffith, Happy Days. Ronnie Howard, Happy Days. Yeah, he's the producer of this. Formula One movie called Rush. It's about the life and times of Nicky Lauda, legendary star who nearly died, and his compatriot and competitor, James Hunt of England, who did beat him for the championship and then died. It's really well done. So you're a big Netflix guy. You go find it. <laughs> I'll it's check called it out. Rush. It's by Ronnie Howard. It's it's really good. From that, let's go to soccer because let's talk about what's gone on in England. We haven't seen this in a while, John. Yeah. I mean, the Man City is a great franchise. Um, I watched one of the documentaries like about four or five years ago where they follow them throughout the whole year. And so it's the team that my son has actually really embraced. But now we've got this this um, this Swede that has come on to the team and it's just rocking the Premier League. We've had great goal scorers in modern day professional soccer in the English Premier League. The two most recent superstars, Harry Kane. Uh, and Mo um, Salah, hmm. both have done well. Both scored a lot of goals. This guy is busting the records. Erling Holland comes from Norway. He played in division, oh, I think, division two in Germany, and somehow Manchester City scoped and sighted him and said, "Star, star in the making," and they got him. They got him in a transfer deal. He has scored 17 goals in his first 11 games in the English Premier League. That's incredible. And I think he's up to 24 goals in all international competitions for City. He is on a pace to score 57 goals in the league. In the league. He's a marked man. Everybody knows what he does as a striker, mm -hmm. what he can do as a midfielder, and they can't stop him, you know, unless he gets hurt. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a really fascinating story. So if you've never sampled soccer early on Saturdays, English Premier League is televised back here. If you're like us, you get up at 4.30 in the morning and you mm -hmm. watch one of the games and they run them all day. Um, watch this kid. He is really special. But think about that. 17 goals, first 11 games in the English Premier League, and everybody knows he's going to get the ball, and everybody knows that he's going to take the shots, and yet they still can't check him, mark him, or stop him. Yeah, and then they got Kevin De Bruyne on that team, who's the midfielder, who's like the point guard, right? And he can set him up. So uh, that team is really talented. Um, their coach, you know, what's his name? Pep, I think. He's, he's a great coach as well. Um, some, I was reading some of uh, the other soccer stars were warning, um, you you know, Erling that be careful around Pep, you know, because he has his own agenda that might be a little detrimental to your career. But that doesn't seem to be a problem for Erling Holland. So good on those guys. And uh, let's, you know, we're looking forward to not just the Premier League, but, you know, World Cup is right around the corner. I will tell you, the coaches in the EPL, they're cut from a real different cloth. Holy cow. You talk about coaches and agendas and personalities. Mm -hmm. Boy, they dump all over these guys, and then they get fired. And I mean, it's it's a strange environment, professional soccer in the English Premier League. But it's 
it's pretty cool. It's a pretty, pretty unbelievable player. Okay, we got a lot of people that want to participate in our fans forum. Uh, and we remind you that we are on our YouTube channel, on Facebook, on Twitter, and all the audio platforms led by Apple every Thursday. And then during the week, we also post special segments of our podcast on my YouTube channel. So you can watch the entire YouTube presentation and, or come back during the week and be able to pick up snippets of some of the things that we've talked about. John, fans forum, it looks like it's kind of busy. What do you want to talk about? And you got questions, we got answers. Yes, yeah, so this is from George Lazo Jr. Bleep and brilliant. You are correct. We are. Thank you very much. I hope you become a regular. And by the way, George, you'll like this podcast. You got to check my website because it's all written and you need to text, email, and tweet all your followers, and I know you got followers, and just introduce them to our podcast, but also introduce them to my website. And yes, John agrees with me now. We are blooping brilliant. Yeah, and he goes on to say the best damn 15. <laughs> you know, I mean, we usually do, we usually go 45 minutes to an hour on some of these, but uh, you're a legend, Clot. You're a legend, Hacksaw. On we go. Next one. Yeah. So um, I have a question for you is uh, the Padres, I've been hearing some talk about. Jerks and Profar might be opting out of his deal. I mean, what, what's your take on that? Well, there, there is a group of guys who will become free agents. I think there's nine of them total uh, effective at uh, the end of the World Series. Five days after the World Series, players can file for free agency. Profar might. But the question is, what was his track record before he got here? Very erratic, very up, very down in Texas and in Oakland. Why would you leave a place and had a relationship with A.J. Preller prior? Why would you leave a place that has given you an opportunity to play and play well? We'll see. He goes on the open market. Maybe he comes back here a little bit higher price. He goes on the open market. Maybe they find somebody else, too. you gotta be got to be leery about that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and here's another one for you. Has there been any updates on the Matt Ariza situation? None at all. Um, I've talked to... Police officials who have seen records, it's a, a lot of gray area there as to what's happened prior involving this woman, what happened in that case. Uh, the university is closed mouth in their own Title IX investigation. The fact that it's gone on for such a long period of time, I mean, it, now, it's, now it's 13 months since this occurred leads me to believe there's a lot of gray area of he said, she said, and they can't get to the bottom of it. So it's unresolved right now. It's still a blemish on Matt Arise's professional career, and obviously the woman is damaged. Well, I guess we'll have to wait and see whether this case actually goes to court, the lawsuit mm -hmm. that she has filed against those three former San Diego State players. Well, let's let's stay with San Diego State. You got any uh, like opening thoughts on the beginning of the Aztec basketball season? I asked Brian Dutcher last week, shame on me for asking that type of question, because the roster's loaded. Roster's got a cross-section of a lot of veteran players with an extra year of eligibility, transfer recruits, and a couple of freshmen, and some young guys that are growing into the position. They look really good, and they're, they have a cross-section of talent that can play all types of games. And I said, does this have the potential to be 30-2 and two this season? Now, granted, the schedule's <laughs> tough. They have a lot of tough non-conference mm -hmm. games, and they play in the Maui Classic. They're going to be really good. Stay free of injury. Their bigs are really dynamic. Their forwards are long and can stroke it and shoot it. they got a lot of experience in the backcourt. If these guys, if they can stay healthy, if they're not in the Elite Eight, by the time I get to next spring, I'll be disappointed. They are really good. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm just really fired up for the season. They've got, uh, you know, the returning players were well, the number two defense in the country last year. They bring back their, the top defensive player in the league, and they've added all this talent that can score the ball. So imagine if we can hold the defense, if the defense can hold the opponent below 60, and maybe the offense can put up 80 or more, and then you're going to have a magical year. Uh, well, they struggled last year to find points, but now they got some firepower to complement Matt Bradley and some of the other guys. They're really good. Let's wrap this up. Remind the people where they can go uh, to subscribe to our podcasts. 
Yeah, so um, if you go to LeeHacksawHamilton.com, there you there's a button on the on the right side of the screen where you can subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, all of the popular audio only platforms. At the same time, you can go on YouTube and click on the subscribe button, click on the bell, you'll get the alerts. So there's a lot of ways to connect with Hacksaw and make sure you follow Hacksaw on Twitter and on Facebook and subscribe. So uh, a lot of ways to connect. Thanks for being part of our Thursday broadcast. Hope you enjoyed all the different topics on the table. We'll talk to you next Thursday and stay in touch with us during the course of the week on my website, LeeHacksawHamilton.com. John, have yourself a great sports weekend. Thanks for being with us. Join us again for Hacksaw's Headlines on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. And find the audio version on your favorite podcast app. Touchdown, San Diego! For more content, go to LeeHacksawHamilton.com.